Hello, everyone, and welcome to Grid Talks, Impact Investing, How to Leverage IRA Funding to Bring Clean Energy Projects to Environmental Justice and Tribal Communities. This is our sixth webinar in the series, and Grid Talks is a new webinar series to bring together leaders from the renewable energy field and environmental justice movement, and to discuss clean energy access and community-centered solutions. These webinars seek to amplify the voices of GRID's communities and share the stories, experiences, and work that are creating mission impact and systemic change. My name is Maya Anthony, she, her. I'm a portfolio manager at GRID Alternatives, and I'm calling in today from San Diego. Please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat, say hello, and where you're calling in from today. I'm excited to introduce you all to our three panelists, but first a few quick event logistics. This webinar will be recorded and available for later to rewatch and for those who are unable to join. Your video and audio are automatically mute muted, but you can add to the chat and ask questions via the Q&A button. Be sure to submit your questions to the panelists. We will ask as many as we can towards the end of the session. All right, let's get into today's event. Today, we have three incredible panelists. First, we have Tungshi Claremont, the Tribal Development Director and Tribal Solar Accelerator Fund Managing Director at Grid Alternatives. Welcome. Now we also have John Fox, Clean Energy Development Manager at Enterprise Community Development. Welcome, John. And Joel Blaine, Director of Project and Business Development at Grid Alternatives. Welcome, Joel. Hey, everybody. My video is not working. But no worries. I'll be there in a second. Glad, glad you're here. All right. With historic federal funding and the passing of the Inflation Reduction Act, community based organizations, foundations, and affordable housing developers have a significant role to play in supporting equitable clean energy projects in environmental justice communities and on tribal lands. Today, we're bringing together leaders from these sectors for a discussion about the critical investments needed today to build capacity to capture these new incentives and funding opportunities and ensure that the underserved communities receive the resources, technical expertise, and funding to create mission impact. All right, I'm gonna start off with a round of intro introductions. Um, each panelist, can you please tell us a little bit more about your current role in the industry, what you do? Uh, we can start off with John. Hi, uh, thanks, Maya. Yeah, my name is John Fox. Uh, I work with uh, Enterprise Community Development. We are the development arm of Enterprise Community Partners, our larger uh, organization that provides solutions, capital, as well as uh, uh, property management uh, focus. My my uh, focus has been on clean energy and developing uh, renewable energy projects at uh, the sites that we own, operate which is now uh, up to 117 properties, uh, 21,000 residents in the Mid-Atlantic. And we have developed over three megawatts of solar, uh, battery storage, EV charging, and energy efficiency improvements. So thank you for letting me uh, be here. Hong Shi, do you want to go next? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tengshi Klerma. I'm an enrolled member of the Sistan Wapton Dakota. I'm also Sichangu Lakota from Rosebud, South Dakota. I currently sit in Iowa um, near the Meskwaki settlement, which is the only tribe in the state of Iowa. Um, I have worked with Grid Al or at Grid Alternatives uh, for about four and a half years as the managing director of the Tribal Solar Accelerator Fund. Um, and excited to be here and to be able to talk about our wonderful program and the tribal partners that we are so blessed to work with and get to continue to support year after year. Thank you. Go ahead, Joel. Yeah, thanks. Hey, everyone. Joel Blaine here. Uh, use pronouns he, him, his. I am Director of Business and Project Development at GRID, uh, based out of the headquarters office. Been with GRID for about four years. Uh, and my main focus here at GRID is working on our 
clean energy loan fund called the Energy Resilience Fund. Uh, it's a new new line of work for Grid to help provide more inclusive and uh, competitive financing to get more low income and BIPOC dedicated solar projects and clean energy projects funded. So thanks for having me on. Awesome, thank you all for the wonderful introductions. I'd like to start off the panel with a question for you, John. How are affordable housing developers thinking about opportunities of solar storage and EV infrastructure as part of long-term housing sustainability and affordability? Well, I think, I mean, just a little bit of history, if I could. Um, I, I think a lot of us started out uh, in, in mainly energy efficiency improvements because it made economic sense to deploy those and reduce the overall cost of our building. So it was much more of a cost saving approach to uh, what we were doing. But literally over the past probably two to three years, there's been a more increased focus on the health of our communities, the um, the, the the carbon off the carbon footprint of our uh, total portfolio, and so we've kind of merged the 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 energy savings efforts with um, the improvements that we can make in the lives of our residents, uh, literally uh, through the, the healthier communities, um, and, and then also doing our part to sort of grow um our portfolio while not actually impacting the the environment and um i think with those approaches we've we've launched a lot greater uh importance into active renewable generation on site um using community solar community energy projects including wind uh potentially biogas and other other to um sort of not only again, not only buy down the energy savings or the costs of uh, the energy inputs into operating our buildings and also providing that to our residents, um, but also really doing our part to maintain a cleaner planet. Great. Thanks, John. I'm going to turn it over to Tong Chi. Um, more and more indigenous nations are interested in locally cited and controlled renewable energy that offer the opportunity to take control of energy resources, keep local dollars in the community, and reap long-term economic and community resilience benefits from their investment. Could you elaborate on the specific advantages and unique benefits that solar power offers to tribes and community members and how that relates to energy independence and tribal sovereignty? Yeah, I think I just like to provide a little bit of background and just wanted to, um, you know, say that over the past decade, GRID has um, worked with a number of tribes in one capacity or another. And so um, GRID is not new to developing relationships with tribal partners um, because of their, you know, longstanding support and investment in tribal communities, especially around direct solar installation and job training. Um, and we're proud to say, you know, over the past decade, our tribal construction team has installed over eight megawatts of solar, which is, um, you know, very unique to tribal communities because, you know, not, I mean, given that there's 574 federally recognized tribes, um, eight megawatts of solar is just the start of it. Um, just imagine if we could, you know, work with every single federally recognized tribe, what that solar energy generation potential would be. Um, I think GRID has it, you know, has the ability to continue to work with, you know, 20 to 30 tribes every year, just like the Tribal Solar Accelerator Fund has been doing over the last five years. Um, and, you know, again, over the last decade, it just became clear and evident that, you know, we needed to provide not just that direct solar installation, but the access to funding, um, technical assistance, um, because a lot of this project development um, takes a lot to, to get tribes on board with at times, especially if they're smaller tribes. Um, but again, it did become clear that we needed to support tribes in a, you know, more meaningful way on the funding side, which is how the Tribal Solar Accelerator Fund uh, began five years ago. 
Um, and since then, you know, we're really a trusted partner in Indian country um, because we are a reflection of the tribal com tribal communities that we work with. I'm really proud to say that our our team is um, all federally recognized tribal members coming from these communities. Um, you know, really upholding those cultural values and place based knowledge and life ways that come along with this work. It's not just you know going into a community and saying you know would you like you know for us to develop some solar for you. It's more about you know, understanding where they're coming from um, and how, again, how they protect tribal sovereignty. So thank you for that question. I think it's very important because the ability to regulate and develop clean energy is an expression of energy sovereignty and self-determination for tribal communities. Um, you know, many regulations and legal frameworks um, are just a few of the challenges that tribal communities face to ensure equitable, renewable energy access. Um, and then of course the future of solar PV in tribal communities is also essential and eminent to a tribe's ability to become energy resilient and energy sovereign. Um, so I guess kind of what this looks like um, at that intersection of energy independence and tribal sovereignty, um, it's really about complementing what tribes already know and practice um, and of course, despite the many climate challenges that climate related challenges that tribes face, um, tribes should be allowed to, of course, participate in meaningful um, scientific and programmatic efforts to understand how climate change impacts them. And so a number of these elements that, you know, may look different in a tribal community, whether that's um, you know, combining sovereignty and self-determination um, or the environmental benefits, economic benefits, social benefits. Um, it really just looks different in these communities. And so what we aim to do at the Tribal Solar Accelerator Fund and within GRID's tribal focused work is really to meet the tribe's unique needs um, and their innovative strategies for stewarding their own um, cultural ways of environmental sustainability. Thanks, Tongshi. All right, Joel. <clears throat> um, you did mention a little bit about Energy Resilience Fund. I'm hoping you could speak a little bit more about what Energy Resilience Fund is and some of the learned lessons that GRID has from providing different bridge loans to rebate funded projects and where does it see Energy Resilience Fund growing? Great, yeah, thanks for that question. Yeah, just a quick recap of Energy Resilience Fund and kind of how, how that got started. Um, GRID's been doing clean energy development in, in low-income and BIPOC communities for 20 years or more, depending on when you, when you start the timer. And, you know, initially starting out with primarily incentive or grant-funded projects for single family that were fully covered and the projects were, you know, fully donated to homeowners. Uh, being able to branch out and serve a broader market of renters and other community members, maybe not homeowners, um, commercial nonprofits, it was clear that there was gap financing needed ways to finance projects outside of just incentive funding. Uh, and so GRID launched Energy Resilience Fund with the goal of bringing in philanthropic impact investments as a way to provide some of that financing and debt and, and gap funding to make sure those projects were still able to go forward uh, in addition to or without uh, grant and incentive funding. Uh, so we've been around for a couple of years um, and kind of continuing to grow and build that capacity as a new kind of tool and arm of grid to, to kind of reach a broader market and serve more, more of the community. Um, yeah, I think one of the things we learned kind of throughout that whole process and through Energy Resilience Fund is that uh, incentive funding, powerful federal funding, other forms of funding are awesome, uh, but they don't solve everything. There's always uh, a benefit and a need for philanthropic uh, funding and, and impact investing to make sure those projects go forward. And what Energy Resilience Fund is focused on a lot recently has been bridge loans to projects to help them cover upfront costs while waiting for 
rebates or incentives that come back after construction is completed or at least started. Um, so we focus a lot on the SOMA program in California, uh, Solar on Multifamily Affordable Housing, which is a really awesome program, provides you know, 80% of the project costs to affordable housing projects that, that dedicate you know, the savings directly to tenants, kind of that final frontier of, of solar, providing you know, savings to renters and, and master metered properties or individually metered properties. Um, but one of the challenges we saw was that low income developer, dedicated developers like Grid and even the project owners themselves uh, you know, had real challenges coming up with that upfront capital to pay for that 80% of the project or more um, kind of out of pocket. And so Energy Resilience Fund was doing and is doing low cost bridge loans to help cover all those upfront costs uh, on behalf of the project while waiting for that rebate and incentive funding to come back. And we think this is like a fortuitous um, you know, set up for what we see coming down from Inflation Reduction Act, uh, the direct pay incentive and other potential programs that come out of the EPA funding, you know, if those are, again, rebate or, or funding that's provided after the project is completed or at least started, you know, a way to step in and help bridge the gap for those projects to make sure that they're not missing out on these amazing kind of incentives and, and, and funding coming from the federal government. Uh, and so we're, we're really optimistic. We think there's a huge kind of opportunity and need for kind of that impact investing work to step in and really leverage a lot of the funding that's coming down the pipe in this kind of historic new, new program. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, well, kind of on that note, with the historic federal funding and the passing of um, the Inflation Reduction Act, it's a game changer for providing new opportunities for community-based nonprofits and tribes to pursue direct ownership or long-term share in project revenues through the direct pay ITC and other funding from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. What are the, some challenges that still exist for nonprofits and tribes in accessing and going after these big incentives? And so this is a question for everyone. Um, we can start with whoever feels inclined to answer first, but we'll give everyone a, a chance to answer. Any of you want to jump in? Sure, I'll go. <laughs> the Inflation Reduction Act, I mean, that is one of the most significant legislation to invest in clean energy um, to date. And so, you know, with over 722 million directly, um, you know, directed toward tribal communities and in other indigenous communities. Um, it's really exciting, but it's also feeling like a sense of urgency, which is also um, a big challenge for tribes because of the different ways, you know, 574 tribes operate or how they, um, you know, if they're large or small, um, this is a really just significant um, time for clean energy. Um, but I think some of maybe the challenges that exist for tribes is, you know, it's really maybe even tribal politics and some of the internal processes and getting tribes involved, um, getting them the seat at the table to even understand what these guidelines mean. Um, and then, of course, you know, having clear and concise communication from, you know, the federal guidelines to tribes, um, that is always going to be a challenge. Um, I think also the, this funding will help to address, of course, clean energy needs, but it's also going to address some of the challenges and opportunities related to sovereignty and resource sustainability. I know within the Tribal Soul Accelerator Fund, our tribal partners, um, you know, when we read through these amazing grant applications, not only do we hear that, yes, they would love to um, install solar on, you know, every one of their facilities and, you know, homes and become a net zero community, but it's also about addressing you know, food, energy, water resources, all of that that is connected to environment and economic security. Um, and 
while also taking in that into consideration, like this all needs to be kind of in a um, cultural in place based context. And so tribes have just that different understanding of having that interdependent relationship with the environment. And so, you know, having funds to develop new clean energy infrastructure, that's great, but it's also all these other considerations um, that need to be taken by, you know, these federal uh, funding opportunities. Um, and then, of course, the challenge also is the capacity to even access these funds. Um, you know, for our team, we're a small all of our you know tribal focused work we're all a small team whether it's our construction team um, our grant making team our workforce development team there's just a, a handful within our program and so uh, trying to meet the needs of over 80 tribal partners at this time is just uh it's gonna continue to be a huge challenge until um you know, others step in and say, we recognize this need and we're here to support that. That was uh, great. I just wanted to add a couple things to what Tangsu was saying, because um, for a uh, affordable housing developer that deals quite a lot in uh, tax credits to get our projects off the ground, we're sort of well we're able to well function within a sort of tax credit environment. And the um, the thing that the the IRA did just out of the gate, frankly, was to provide some assurance on the tax credit side that there that's going to be around for a while and it's a 10 year runway at the moment. And that that really gave us um, a chance to say literally sit back and, and say, okay, we don't have to get these projects uh, aggressively moving, um, meaning like within the next year or two before the phase out of the tax credit occurs, we actually have some time and we can plan it out and work it within our our, our total capital plan as, as the projects that we uh, that, that we developed. And just anecdotally, we were about to close on a, I was, we were supposed to close on a 2.2 megawatt uh, solar facility in July, June of last year, right before, but that got delayed for, uh, for permitting reasons. And fortunately so, because we were modeling out a 26% tax credit at the time after the IRA, we were able to get a 30% tax credit. And that's meaningful to our residents because what we offered was 20% energy savings based off of a 26% tax credit um, prior to the passage of the IRA. But what we were able to do after, immediately after passage, and we closed on this in December uh, of last year, is to increase that uh, energy savings percentage to our residents to 25%. And it's just such a, even a 4% tax benefit can really uh, make a significant impact in the lives of uh, our, our residents. And I think that's one of the um, biggest benefits of the Inflation Reduction Act. We still have the issues with interconnections. Uh, <laughs> we still have the issues, the timeframes on getting things permitted. As a, as a nonprofit uh, you know, a developer, and we have a lot of uh, low-income housing tax credit properties, we still have approval processes that are far longer in terms of the time frame to get these approvals from property lenders, property investors that um, uh, a lot of for-profit developers, frankly, don't have or commercial developers don't have. So because we have that, to have a greater runway, and then I'd say one other thing is to recognize that there's a mass of funds literally ready to be moved into our market to fund tribal governments, low-income uh, housing developments. That just gives us a, a sense of um, a surety that we're, we're, we're going to have access to some of the capital uh, to do it. Um, and, and we can really spend more of our time on addressing those those issues in terms of getting the developments off the ground, like I was mentioning, the in, the interconnection, the the building permits, and the um, the approval processes. Yeah, I feel like you guys nailed a lot of the the key things. Um, you know, I think Tanshi, like you mentioned, having the capacity to develop 
those clean energy strategies and then turning that into actual projects that are would be ready to get financing and then taking that uh and and finding like the ecosystem that would support it like there's a lot of early on prerequisite work that needs to happen before there's projects even ready to kind of get some of this incentive funding uh you think about like what does the workflow what is the workforce going to look like how do we scale that up uh equitably and efficiently so that there are folks ready to participate in the clean energy economy and and get these projects built um you know there's 27 billion coming from EPA for uh, you know grants and financing and what is it what is the ecosystem of community lenders look like how do we get them ready so that you know, trusted community partners are there and ready to, to lend to and partner with projects and make sure they get financed. And then even just kind of navigating, I think, the patchwork, great patchwork of federal programs that are out there, you know, what incentives apply, what tax credit apply, what programs should these projects be looking at and being able to navigate that, I think are um, potential challenges that are going to come up from accessing and really implementing and, and passing on the savings down to customers. Um, and then, you know, the challenges, like we mentioned with bridge financing, let's say you've, you've, ecosystem's totally ready, you've got the workforce, you got a great pipeline of projects that are ready to go. Uh, and then you're looking at the direct pay ITC or the elective pay ITC so that nonprofits and tribal workers can actually own the projects themselves and take advantage of the ITC, you know, being able to come up with that 30 to 70% uh tax credit value up front um just you know i think that's a daunting challenge for a lot of organizations to have that much capital and just finding the right partners and capital sources funding sources to help bridge those those gaps in funding uh to make sure that you know there is true kind of direct ownership by tribes and nonprofits, and that all of that benefit gets passed down to the community through that program I see a question about ITC and I, I have to hop in there. That, yeah, do it. That stands for uh, investment tax credit. And so that's a program from Treasury that provides a refund or a rebate or, or a discount on projects based on the project cost. Uh, as John mentioned, historically it was 30% and then had stepped down to 26 and was on its way down to 22%. And the Inflation Reduction Act bumped it back up to 30% uh, baseline and then added some really powerful adders uh, based on where the project was located in energy communities, if it served low income or tribal communities, um, and then other kind of components could bump uh, that, that discount all the way up to 70% uh, total. Yeah, maybe before we um, move on to, if, if you're willing to kind of explain a little bit of the difference between direct pay, um, Great, yeah. I think it was helpful for the audience. Sure, yeah, and John, John or Tongsi can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, historically the tax credit was something that only taxable entities that had a huge tax liability, like a lot of taxes owed or due at the end of the year um, could capitalize on this tax credit because it's a return of taxes that you would have otherwise paid to the government. Uh, and so historically nonprofits and tribes, which are tax exempt, have no tax liability, have no tax bill at the end of the year, and therefore couldn't participate in the investment tax credit. And so typically relied on third party investors coming in who would contribute some of the money for the project and in turn kind of own the project over at least five years. And that tax investor would get to claim the tax credit, uh, which is which was, uh, you know, effective or efficient, but really left out kind of nonprofit tribal communities and LMI communities in particular with an inability to access it themselves directly. Yeah, and, and Joel, I, let me just add one or two things because I think it, it gets to some of the real big benefits of direct pay over the even transferability, which is now offered, but then the, the complicated tax structures that you had to uh, put together for in order to benefit from the investment tax credit. So the um, generally what we've seen in just pricing of the ITC is somewhere in the range of 
87 up to maybe 94 cents per tax credit. So for every dollar of tax credit an investor would actually get, they'll pay anywhere from say 87 cents to up to 94, which is really high. And, and, and I mean, 94 cents is, I don't see that much. Um, it's more like around on average of 90 cents. So fundamentally that is beneficial to the project, but only 20% uh, of, a, of an investor that's a, a tax equity investor comes in at the project level, the remaining 80% gets paid after the project is commissioned. And so there is a gap in terms of being able to, um, you know, to be able to get the whole project constructed formally. And that's just under the current, you know, structure. Plus there's the complication of providing the specific return that you need to the to the tax equity investor um, and then making sure that they exit properly at the after the fifth year. So there are some complications to that, that the direct pay and also the transferability now, because you could actually transfer this literally, it doesn't have to be an ownership um, uh, alleviates. But what we're finding is if you take a direct pay structure, and yes, you're foregoing a lot of the depreciation benefits that you get at an equity basis, but because energy is such an appreciating uh, uh, commodity, really, um, it's growing on average of 3% a year, the depreciation is kind of meaningless because you're, you're if, if you looked at it, you, you um, it, it, as an as a nonprofit, you, you you don't have to pay taxes after, say the the six year anyway, and that's when these energy generating assets provide the most value, or is in the later years than they are in the earlier years. So after the fifth year, say for instance, and up to up to year twenty, and so it's I thought that was really important as a as a financial exercise to recognize that depreciation really doesn't impact us a lot it's actually saving the tax dollars and being able to take that income that is appreciating at say 3% a year and be able to put that back into either providing additional savings to residents um providing some resident benefits you know things that are really meaningful to you know to our community and what what nonprofits do just as a as a as modus operandi. So, um, the other benefit on the direct pay that we find is, if you look at just financing direct pay versus financing a traditional tax credit, you can actually get on par something around ninety six to ninety seven cents, uh, you know, a credit once you figure out all the all the financing costs. And again, even though it's maybe three or four cents on a, on the dollar per credit, we are able to to provide um, what we did the math for every three cents that we're able to get back in a tax credit that we don't have to pay uh, the market an undervalued asset. Then we would able we would be able to provide an additional four and a half percent savings to our residents. So you know the the the, the numbers really do add up. Um, and are going to be beneficial for us, you know, going forward on the direct pay. Sorry, I, I hope that wasn't too complicated, but I did want to add some of that. that that's super insightful. Um, and I mean, it's really important to think about and consider. All right. So moving on to our next question, and this is for the whole group as well. What should the role of philanthropy be to unlock these critical investments and ensure the outcomes of these public incentives and investments really do reach the environmental justice communities they're intended for? I can I can jump in to start. Yeah, I think this is a great question. Um, I think there's a real opportunity for and need for philanthropy to step in now and later. I think there's, um, you know, a lot of folks are interested in waiting to see what IRA is gonna look like uh, or the GGRF funding. So that's the greenhouse gas reduction fund from EPA. You know, how much of project costs will be covered by direct pay ITC, which is all great and smart to be, uh, you, know, consult, you know, coordinated in how you're providing funding and impact. Um, but I think as we talked about earlier, there's a lot of this like early work that's really needed to get everything ready to even absorb this historic amount of funding that's coming down. Um, 
And I think there's a great opportunity for philanthropy to step in both now and kind of building that ecosystem and getting everything project and, and finance ready and coming in later to help leverage a lot of those federal dollars that are coming out from projects. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of projects that are currently in development now that shouldn't be held up in waiting for uh, IRA funding to come out. And then there's a lot of work that's needed to get projects ready so that when IRA funding does come, they're ready to go, they can use it efficiently, and that there's capacity built among all the organizations and in the ecosystem so that they can really absorb and pass the, the, the funding around and really deliver the impact and benefit the community. Yeah, could I add uh, one thing is that, and this is where I find that the, at least the way we look at it, and again, as I mentioned, we, we, we have always focused on how do we reduce costs of housing, how to reduce cost of uh, all all the, the other um, sort of life costs for our residents. What what can we do to help better them in terms of cost reduction, um, so that they can have better lives? That's ultimately how we think. And so for 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 us, we look at how do we build a capital stack on the project itself in terms of how do we layer in the appropriate amount of debt, any type of grants that we can get, and then any type of tax equity, et cetera, so that we can provide additional economic savings to our residents. So we're always looking at that as our main source. So any project that we evaluate has to have across the board, at least a 20% energy savings that we can pass on to our residents. Fortunately for us, for me, I, I've come. I, I've been in enterprise for two years. I haven't found a project that doesn't meet that, so it's it's great. But but the the question then becomes, how can we do more? What can we do more of, and how can we structure the capital stack so that that I, we can provide twenty five percent, thirty percent? What can we do that that that'll make that those improvements? You can do that when it, you add in certain specific credits. Uh, tax credits I'm talking about at the um, federal level, including the low-income adder tax credits. But there is also generally just a slight, a small slice of that of that stack that if we're able to layer it in, we have to, we can take on maybe three percent, five percent less debt. And if we can take on that debt, then we can actually add that uh, energy. If we can take less debt, then we can add that those energy savings to the um the projects and i always see that sort of slice somewhere around like five percent of the total costs uh in, in in the projects that we offer so well i think i'll just add kind of on the the end of how i go about talking with uh different funders and um within philanthropy and you know, really driving home the point that without philanthropic support and investment in Indian country, um, you know, it's going to continue to be a challenge to dismantle the inequities of, you know, the energy crisis, environmental and social justice issues, um, because without that support, we're unable to, you know, fully see how to, you um, I don't know, promote, you know, healthy economies and a healthy um, restoration of tribal lands. So it's really kind of just a, a broad topic that is sometimes hard to discuss with philanthropy because of where philanthropy started and where, um, where it is today. Um, oftentimes they they are saying that they are mission aligned or values aligned, um, but it doesn't feel like that in Indian country. It doesn't feel like that within our own tribal communities because of the different, um, you know, value systems that we have. Um, but as far as, you know, really, again, getting back to that philanthropic support, it's important because without that kind of support, we're unable to you know, build that capacity, like I spoke about earlier. I mean, it's really one of the biggest needs that we know and that we have, you know, expressed by our tribal partners is 
in that pre-development and technical assistance phase. Um, we can only do so much at Grid Alternatives and our tribal focus programming to support that. Um, and without kind of that whole pre-development and technical assistance, it's hard to even um, fathom what it looks like to develop a, a proposal for $50 million or even $5 million is, you know, a huge task for a tribe to take on. Um, and so it is that human capacity building need um, that's imperative to you know, support the policy and finance, workforce development and training, project development, contracting and grant writers, tribes don't have all of these folks in place. And so again, we hear that from our tribal partners, um, you know, asking us for that kind of support. And we don't even have that internally here at GRID for our tribal work. Um, and so really building that up into you know, within our own organization so that we could better support tribes um, is really a goal of our of our tribal program and our and our team. Um, because, you know, each tribe is culturally, geographically, economically diverse. Um, and without, you know, the funding support, it's really hard to see um, tribes building up, you know, on their own because there's so many other priorities within tribal communities. It's, um, yes, energy should be a priority, but oftentimes, you know, it's about, you know, the health and safety of tribal members. Um, and so, again, just equitably, equitably providing access um, to funding for tribes. Um, to help with those upfront solar costs is, is helpful from philanthropy, but it's also, again, that human capital that comes with it. That was great. Yeah. Thanks, maybe, maybe just to add on to that, it's, it seems totally clear that like the capacity building at the community level is critical. I mean, if you think about uh, the application process for a lot of these grants and even finding out what grants and programs are available is is a big challenge in having like funding now and capacity building now so that when kind of the floodgates open up there is somewhere for that money and for that funding and for that programming to go um you know i think we see the same thing to to an extent among like community lenders there's CDFIs across the country that are deeply embedded in communities have partnership with community organizations, uh, native CDFIs, for example, and they're earmarked to be a big recipient of a lot of this funding, uh, but, but many, maybe 75% of CDFIs don't currently do clean energy lending. And so if you think about how is the money, how is this 27 billion or 20 billion from the greenhouse gas reduction fund that's intended to go to these types of programs, going to arrive there and go out the door quickly so that projects are built uh, and impact is delivered. And you know a lot of that funding doesn't come out until potentially 2024, 2025. Um, and so it seems like there's we have this runway of need right now to get everybody ready and building that capacity among like the whole ecosystem, you know, uh, including workforce development so that there you know is an equitable and scalable workforce there ready to install and build projects is, is pretty critical. The other point I just wanted to highlight too is just, so there's a lot of work now that needs to happen. And I think there's a clear role for philanthropy in that, um, but also after IRA, like IRA is not going to be the magic bullet. It's not gonna solve everything. There's always funding gaps. There's always like limitations and timing of capital that's gonna come out. And so I think philanthropy can also really step into leverage IRA money, um, you know, the NCIF, I forget what it stands for, <laughs> GGRF funding, um, you know, has a leverage requirement for, for these lenders to access outside capital. And I think philanthropy can play a role in, you know, both being the leverage itself and leveraging more market capital to come in at a really impactful rate, because the challenge is that this money does need to reach communities at an impactful rate to really make a difference. Like John said, like every percent counts, every percent equals the amount of savings or relates to the savings and kind of benefit that the communities are seeing. So lots of ways for philanthropy being involved, I think.
All right, we're going to be moving into some audience Q&A. Um, there's a lot of great questions. So I'm going to kind of try to combine maybe a few. Um, this first question, there's going to be two questions. They're both um, about workforce development or job training. So the first one, Tongshi, was there a career pathway presented to tribal communities? And did that involve partnership with existing job education infrastructure in the different nations? Um, and then just I'm going to also note. Uh, yeah, let's just start with that one. Okay, I did not listen very well. <laughs> Okay. Was there a career pathway presented to tribal communities and did that involve partnership? Um, through our grant making at the Tribal Solar Accelerator Fund, we encourage, you know, that workforce development and training component to each of each one of the grants that are awarded. Um, and so it, you know, it just depends actually on the size of the project, um, the size of the community. Um, what other, you know, tribal programs are in place that can, you know, help coordinate and assist with, with the training component. But our tribal program, um, the installation team is, you know, such a great resource and they, you know, they do whenever they are contracted for, um, you know, project uh, installation, they do a number of training opportunities um, for tribal members. Um, I think what's unique too is that, you know, through our grant making, oftentimes tribes uh, become full owners of their systems. Um, and so it's kind of incumbent that, you know, tribes are able to provide that O&M on these projects. Um, and so it is, you know, they see that as also as a value to train their own tribal members so they can be responsible for that operation and maintenance of the system. Um, and so oftentimes, you know, that workforce development and training, it is incorporated into every single one of the projects that our grid uh, tribal construction staff um, installs. And so uh, we are building our workforce development and training program up as we speak. We're, you know, really excited to be able to um, kind of formalize a lot of the curriculum that is available at GRID and contextualizing that into a more cultural and place-based um, type of program. So I hope that answered the question. Was there a second part? I think that, I think that was good, yeah. Um, awesome. And then maybe kind of going off the workforce development aspect, um, someone asked, regarding John's point of generating a 20% savings for residents, does part of your capital stack also include income generated by building solar jobs and career opportunities genera generated by building solar power? So potentially, yes. yeah, go ahead. I, I'll just men mention to you one. So what we decided to do is we built in workforce development as a total as a part of our project costs. And I think what 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 event. So what happened in our last uh, funding round? This is bef this we had already built this in before the Inflation Reduction Act. There are some requirements under the IRA, frankly, and especially with the tax, the low income matters tax credit, um, some of the the funding programs that are coming out that you actually do incorporate uh, prevailing wages and, and workforce development within the scope of your project already. Um, so it's something just to be mindful of that there are some requirements that will be coming down the, the pike on that. But you know, even before that, we decided to to add at least a workforce development component to be because two reasons. One is we thought it was great for our residents to be able to provide them, some access, not only to, you know, saving money through community solar, but also some access to actually getting jobs in the emerging market. And we need, um, we need people actually, <laughs> it's, it's a, we're, we're at a dearth of um, uh, people in the market. So it's really important that we actually bring in well-trained individuals to, to work, not only just on installation, but also on operations and maintenance, on development, on financing. I mean, there's a whole host of uh, opportunities in the market where there's just not enough 
um, job applicants, frankly, qualified job applicants, I should say. Um, so what we did was we built uh, that uh, workforce development as a part of our project budget. And I do think it's really important that you start to begin, as you're thinking about project development, set aside some money. Um, one of the things that we found is we didn't set aside enough money in the in, in the first go round, but it was it actually drove the need to find additional sources to fill the gap so that we could actually provide a, a full cohort of uh, uh, training to uh, 10 technicians that we have actually they're going through the training right now. So um, th 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 those are things even if you don't as if he, even if you I mean, what I'm saying is even if you can't fully fund it within your project, it at least drives the opportunity to find the gap funding and it's out there. You can find it. Thanks. Um, okay, so there's a few more I'm going to lump in and maybe um, Joel, you can speak to this a little bit. Uh, do you see sources of bridge construction funding to the direct payment? And then also, um, what can native CDFIs do now to be able to accept accept funding, um, I think, from the IRA? Uh, I'll start with the second question. So in EPA's Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, there's a program called CCIA. Man, I don't remember the acronym again. But that's that's intended to be funding specifically for CDFIs. And it includes both technical assistance to CDFIs to help them build up clean energy lending practices, um, as well as some initial cap, like seed capital to get started with clean energy lending. So that's the program intended from EPA to, to fund that type of work. Um, and I think some of the things that can be done are connecting with kind of the trade organizations OFN or uh, the native CDFI trade organization to get in the conversations to understand like how the application is going to look to that program. Uh, another thing re um, relevant is GRIDS Energy Resilience Fund does have a CDFI TA program where we bring you know our 20 years or so of experience with clean energy development and help kind of prime the pump, build capacity, help train CDFIs to build new clean energy lending programs, and then even step in to help with some site assessments and feasibility studies to see where there are project opportunities. Um, and then as projects develop and turn into real lending opportunities, GRID and Energy Resilience Fund can help provide some of that technical underwriting. So providing you know, the, the solar or the technology diligence and then you know, CDFIs can take that along in their conventional commercial underwriting and hopefully have you know, um, sort of a back-end service uh, of underwriting to get ready to make those loans. Um, and then once funding is available, you know, I think GRID and ERF would love to do co-investments or loan participations with other CDFIs to help kind of spread the money around and de-risk de -risk projects initially for, for those new lenders that are getting into the space. Uh, the first question repeated again. <laughs> um, the first one or the second one? It was uh, bridge loans for direct pay. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Are there any sources right now that we're seeing for bridge or construction funding to the direct payment? So I'm, I'm guessing for direct pay. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with any exact programs yet that are offering direct pay. I think a lot of folks are waiting for that guidance to come out and then developing new programs to match the new guidance. Um, but I can definitely dig around and see if there are any programs up and running. And then again, Energy Resilience Fund has the in intention of being able to offer that product um, in the near future. And Joel, I will say that there are some CDFIs of particular, those that actually have some type of low-income housing tax credit uh, portfolio that are familiar with that bridge, um, and and then that that can provide uh, that. And and there are we've well our one of our C, our CDFI, which is the Enterprise Community Loan Fund, they have actually been uh, looking into that. And I know that there are other. Uh, CDFIs out there as well that are that are 
not only looking into that, but I have I have heard of through the rumor mill some of some deals being done. Um, but it's there's it's based off of some uh, uh, providing some insurance backstop from like a Swiss Re or a Munich Re. All right, uh, maybe this will be our last question. And I know there's some kind of technical questions about resources or links on how to apply um, for direct pay, what direct pay is, how to how to get some resources so we can likely follow up and provide some of those resources as well. But um, this will be our last question. When writing a grant or investing for a project, how do you balance between project viability and social impact? The tribal communities who have the capacity to develop partnerships might be less in need, whereas some of the most in need communities are the least likely to have the capacity to partner with you on a project. For instance, energy resilience um, projects on Pine Ridge Reservation would be very impactful, but perhaps less viable because of infrastructure issues. That is a good question that we often kind of uh, go back and forth with because, you know, as, as a grant making program, we would love to be able to fund every single application that comes through because I think they're all compelling, they're all going to be impactful, they're all going to, you know, benefit the tribal community. Um, but there comes, you know, with that, we're only able to distribute, you know, a limited amount of funds each year. Um, and so really looking at these applications and understanding, um, you know, the, the community impacts, the environmental impacts. So um, all of that is taken into consideration, although, it, you know, again, we would love to fund each and every application that comes through. Uh, we also take into consideration um, other incentives that the tribe may be leveraging or that is available in their state. Um, we also look at kind of the policy and regulation side of um, clean energy initiatives for that particular state. You know, I mean, there's no state like California with, you know, such um, beneficial policy and regulations. Um, and so you know, other states are not as fortunate. You know, there's a lot of tribes in, in the Midwest, in the Plains that often apply, like you mentioned, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Um, fortunately, we've been able to support, you know, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation with a couple of Tribal Solar Accelerator Fund grants in the past five years. Um, but there are a number of tribes who also are just getting into this space. And so, um, those kind of applications take a little more um, review and sometimes do not get awarded, um, which is why we also have another grant program that provides funding for energy planning. And so oftentimes when we get applications that, you know, tribes are just new into this space, um, they don't have a formal energy plan, which is kind of a barrier. Um, and so once, you know, a, a tribal community develops, you know, takes the time to develop an energy plan, um, that's going to set them up not only for our grants, but also for the larger federal funding opportunities that are available. Um, and so it just, it varies. Yes, um, many projects are, would be in, impactful, but are often not funded. Um, and that's the, that's the real world that we have to you know, live in with grant making um, and trying to also be equitable across Indian country. Awesome. Well, I think that's a wrap for our grid talks today. Thank you so much to all the panelists and everyone who joined and asked really thoughtful questions. Hope you all have a great rest of your week.